Welcome to the Unscripted Authentic Leadership Podcast, a podcast we are seeking to lead change while also seeking to understand. We're also here as a platform for leaders to come together to unite, to develop, and empower other leaders in the areas of business, family, faith, and community. I am your host, Lafayette Lane, joined by my co-host, John LeBron. Today, we are joined by our special guest, Dwan Ben Twyfer. You already know what it is. Go ahead and put those hands together, put those clap emojis in the comment section for our special guest today who has joined us to have a conversation about how to build an empire while raising a family. Just a little bit about Dwan. She is America's most sought after real estate investor who started as a broke single mom who had been fired from Denny's. She has personally flipped over 2000 properties and taught thousands of people how to become financially free. She's affectionately known as the queen of short sales and is considered to be the nation's number one expert on short sales and foreclosures. She's written a couple bestsellers, short sales, pre foreclosure investing, how to sell a house when it's worth less than the mortgage. And her most recent New York Times bestseller was written with Steve Forbes, Success Onomics. She's also a highly sought after and has been featured on Fox and Friends, MSNBC, Good Morning, Colorado and & Company, and many other TV, radio, podcasts, and print media. And today she has joined us here on the Unscripted Authentic Leadership Podcast. Dwan, thank you for coming on. Let's get right into the conversation. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm super excited to be here with you today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we're talking about how to build an empire while raising a family. But before we get to how you built that empire, uh-huh. we have to start with your backstory as a single mother uh, raising a family, working there at Denny's. Tell us how did you go from being a single mother to getting involved in real estate and being highly successful in doing that endeavor? Well, you know, it's uh, a thing, and thanks again for having me on the show and for asking about the backstory. I that was not my plan was to be a single mother, and you know, I was married. I had a baby. I thought I would be like the homeroom mom and the Girl Scout mom and the you know the field trip mom, and I'd be married and I'd have kids, and you know, I just kind of thought that's how things would work out. And as it turned out, when my daughter was only eight months old, uh, my husband and I split up. And I was just like, I, I have an eight month old daughter and I've been fired from Denny's. So I don't even, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. So I, I feel like everybody in their life has like a come to Jesus moment. And that was definitely my come to Jesus moment. So I was really, uh, shocked and I was hurt and, you know, I had this baby and, and my husband with him went the car and the money and I ended up losing a house in foreclosure. It was really, which is really a dark time for me personally. And, uh, and of course I had, you know, my, my dad, God bless him. He, he lives in Ohio. It was like, you can move back to Ohio and live in your old bedroom and raise your daughter. And I thought, Hmm. Moved back to Westmont, Ohio, live in my old bedroom that still to this day has the same green shag carpet as when I was a teenager. Or I'm in Florida, I could like figure something out, put on a big girl pants and like make something happen. And uh, I, and I wasn't even really looking for real estate. I was just looking for a job where I could work from home. That was really the only criteria. I was like, I don't care what it is, as long as it's legal, I can work from home, raise my daughter, I'm in. And uh, I found some people that were real estate investors and they said, well, we buy houses and we fix them up and we sell them. And my naive little ears heard we buy houses and we decorate and we sell them. (laughs) And as it turns out, decorating and rehabbing are not the same thing. So I, I literally just went door knocking to people that were in foreclosure with no idea what I was saying, just like, hey, you know, you're having trouble with your house. I think I can help you out. Let's work together. And uh, this woman, Barbara, like weeks after trying to find just a single deal, she said yes. And she was a single mom and I have a baby. And we're like, you know, we'll just help each other. We'll just, you know, like we did like kind of a hug and a handshake and put an entire real estate transaction together. 
which never should anyone ever do that. You should have contracts. But I don't even know enough to know that. I mean, I was so naive that the only way I know I made it in this business is because God wanted me to. Mm. And, you know, because really, I mean, who would do an entire deal just hugging it out and then trusting that it would all fall into place, you know? Uh, but I made 22 grand on my first deal. And it's yeah. 30 years ago, like when y'all were just, you know, not even born yet, John. Yeah, good. <laughs> 30 years ago. And I was like, wow, I have $22,000. I'm rich. I have so much money. I'm so rich. Oh my God. And that was it. I did another deal and I did another deal. And then I thought, you know, I really like doing this. And I was working and fixing up houses, rehabbing houses. And I enjoyed the work. And my daughter was with me every day. And I was like, wow, I can't believe it. So real wow. estate kind of found me. That's very interesting. That last statement that you closed with, that real estate found you. Because a lot of people in that scenario, they would have moved back home. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I, you know, and it's not that I was too proud to go back, but and yeah. I love my family. But Westmont, Ohio was a very, very small town. And uh, it's very factory minded, working for the man. And, and I had already been living in Florida for a decade. So I was living mm. in Palm Beach and Florida. And, you know, granted, I was getting fired from a lot of jobs, mm -hmm. ah, but it was just the beach and the freedom. And I thought, gosh, darn, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I just, I don't want to move back into my old childhood bedroom with a baby. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that you <laughs> were exposed to too much to greater than yeah. to go back to less than. Yes. And that's where a lot of people struggle. They have never seen beyond the small mindedness. They've never seen beyond the fence, the gate yeah. that this is all there is. If they can only get exposed to there is life beyond these four walls. There's life outside this community. There's life outside of just my family area and the familiar. Yeah. They can step out and fall into their purpose, as you said, because yeah. you were already exposed and already had stepped out. You moved to Florida, moved to a different location. You were already been exposed. There's a quote, uh, from a book I read, I don't remember the book, but it talks about the brain uh, is like a rubber band and the elasticity of the rubber band that once the brain is exposed to more, it can't shrink back to what I came from. And that's yeah. exactly what happened to your situation. It you did. had already stretched beyond that. I cannot go back to West Milton, Ohio. I, can, <laughs> I, I just, I, I mean, and I thought about it because you know, I was yeah. hurt. And I was, I didn't have any money. I had 75 bucks on my purse. When I, sure. so I thought, well, okay, I'm living with my dad's. I mean, maybe for a year or two. But there was just this little piece inside of me that's like, if you go back, you'll never leave again. Mm. And I thought, you know, I just can't do that. I just, I can't. I've already been, like you said, I've already been out. Yeah. I, I was afraid to get stuck. So then I thought, well, I'll do this real estate thing. And I thought, you know, mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, I can certainly go get a job. Yeah. But I knew enough that, at, cause you know, I'm 30 at this point. So I'm, you know, a little smarter than when I went to Florida when I was 18. And I knew enough to know that if I got in a job and had the benefits and had the stuff, even if it was just a fun corporate, whatever, and I'm raising my daughter, I knew enough to know I probably worked that job all the way till she graduated high school because I'd be afraid to start something new. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if I'm ever going to make the break, it's got to be right now. This is sort of like I've got to suck it out and put them in big girl pants or fail and I can get a job. But if I get a job, I'll never try to start something for myself. Wow. Mm. The current time is always the best. Everybody always says, I'll do it next. I'll do it. Guys, right. when you have little kids, I promise you feel busy. My kids are now 10 and 7. The older they get, the busier I get. So when busy. they're 2, go start your company. I'm <laughs> telling you, it's the easiest time. It's the <laughs> easiest one. You started when your daughter was little, obviously, it sounds Very like we little. said. And yes, as they get older, they take more of your time. They want to get involved in sports, activities, they need attention. And rightfully so. But the time is always now. And, and you know, it's funny because I... I didn't know how to, uh, so these investors I met, as they were talking to me, they said, you know, we specialize in helping people that are in foreclosure. Well, I was just going through all that myself. And I thought, 
I would love to have someone that would have came along and tried to help me out. So I literally had this baby on my hip and I would go knocking on doors with a baby and it's like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a real estate investor. I didn't know what I was doing. I was not, I was a real estate investor in my mind. <laughs> and I took that baby with me and all these people all the time say, yeah. oh, I've got kids. I can't do it because of this. And mm -hmm. I'm like, you know what? You should do it because of those things. Exactly. And I, and I love that you said you didn't know what you were doing. Oh, no. But you did it anyways. And we did that exact same thing here on Unscripted. Again, as I said, if you go back to episode one, you'll see the journey from episode one to episode 50 that we didn't have everything all together, but we just started. Do you think that is the key to success? Because you worked at Denny's, you got fired, you went to a divorce uh, uh, and then moved into the real estate. So now you're there. What was the next move after you, you know, you got that twenty two thousand dollars. What did you do after that? Well, it, you know, I always say that uh, that real estate kind of found me because when I first yeah. did it, I didn't even really understand exactly what I was doing. And as it turned out, when I, <laughs> oh, when I think back, I'm just like, oh, I do not know how I'm sitting here today. I started rehabbing yeah. this house. And after the paint was in and the carpet was in, I didn't know how to fix anything. So I went to Home Depot. I took classes. I learned how to tile the floors, build the cabinets. Like. I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, very luckily, I made $50,000 on my second deal. Nice. And I was Don't like, and this is 30 years ago. And this is where like my dad's working in a factory all year for like 30 grand. And right. I was like, oh my gosh, I have like $70,000. And to me, I'm like, I'm so rich right now. <laughs> and I thought, well, anything that I can physically rehab and I can do this, I can make that kind of money. Why would I stop? Mm -hmm. And Ada was with me every day, like every day she was in the houses while I was rehabbing. You know, I should play and draw and color on the walls. And, and, you know, I just, I just kept going and kept going, but it was just like a really short and like two years. I was barely had enough knowledge to share with other people, but, I kept meeting all these people and I would knock on their door that were a lot of single moms too. People yeah. going through divorces, a spouse died, something like that. I thought, you know, you could be a real estate investor. I did it. You could do it too. So I kind of started teaching people how to do it as I was helping them. And then next thing you know, I have like, you know, 10, 15 people like come into my house for these little tiny mini workshops and I'm saying like, I don't know a lot, but I know enough to teach you how to do these couple of things and get out from underneath your job. And I just kind of grew that. So sort of right out of the gate, I i mean, right out of the gate, I was doing it and teaching it. If I learned it, I taught it to somebody else. Nice. Which that, is that, crazy when I think about that. It's like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I think that's amazing because there's a lot of people that get successful and then they hoard all of this success. Mm -hmm secrets to them to themselves because you know now that i've made it i don't want anybody else to make it and if they make it you gotta you know pull yourself up by your own bootstraps no instead of sharing that information no. with someone else to say hey if i can make it easier for you you know you're still gonna have to grind you still got to put that work in but if i can share some information that'll get you a little further faster than it was for me then i'll do that so you weren't selfish in your pursuit of, of the happiness that you had uh, experience and the success that you have. That, that's wonderful. And I had other friends that were going through divorces. I'm like, listen, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. I barely know. I mean, I know a lot more, but still not much. But <laughs> if I can do it, you can. You really can. So I just found myself just really wanting to uh, teach and share with other people because I know so many people that you know, don't like their job or they got a degree and they're unhappy with the degree that they got, or they're working, you know, for some boss that's like, you know, yep. tyrant and nobody wants to come home from work, just so stressed out and strung out every day. Right. And, you know, and real estate investing is certainly not for everybody because, you know, you're working for yourself. You know, if you don't work, you don't get a paycheck. Like it's self-employment is not for everyone, but there's a lot, there's millions of people that want to be self-employed. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know Absolutely. what, I'm just going to share everything I know. And if people do it, great. If they don't, that's okay, too. That, and it says a lot to the, where's the blessing, right? So many people 
refuse to give their knowledge because they think the blessing is in the dollars that they'll get from blocking competition. Mm. But they don't realize what you're doing or did and probably still doing is you helped other people elevate themselves and now get out from under their jobs or single moms support become financially independent, right? So where's the real blessing? Was it in the 70,000, which it was a blessing, but how much more do you remember? You don't, you probably don't remember what you did with the 70,000 necessarily. Maybe you do, but you definitely remember the people who you helped along the way. Oh, yeah. I did so many people. And you know, I am of the mindset because you know, I was in Palm Beach, Florida. So the people I was sharing knowledge with, they were in the same backyard. Mm. And I was looking at like, hey, there's like 5,000 people a month in foreclosure. I certainly can't mm. help everybody. If there's a mm. hundred of us, we can help more people. Sure. And I was always of the mindset that the more people you help, like the further the blessing spreads out. And there's a lot of people I can know in my, when I first started that were like, oh, you know, I, we don't want, we don't share, we don't teach, well, you know, they keep everything to themselves. I'm like, but for what reason? There's, it's not like there's one foreclosure a month and you're the only person doing it. There's thousands, thousands and thousands of people. And so I thought if I could teach 10 and they taught 10 and they taught 10 and they taught 10, there'd be a million of us. Mm -hmm. And still we wouldn't be able to help all the people. Mm -hmm. So is, are you still into real estate investing? The reason why I asked that is because if so, how did you pivot during this whole pandemic situation to keep your real estate investing business going? So uh, I've been doing webinars and live trainings and things, well, like 25 years at this point. And yeah. I've always done a lot of Zoom calls and I, you know, I was already doing all of that. But my husband and I, he's from Clinton, Iowa. And it's a very little small town uh, on the Mississippi River, just right on the river, riverfront town. Yeah. And it's one of those towns that like time left behind. <laughs> and he loves to go back to all his high school reunions. So we've been together 20 years now. So we go back every five years. And and on the last one, it was about four years ago. I was like, man, this little town just needs someone to come in here with some love and and get this town like rejuvenated and so we talked to some people on the board at the council and found out that they were actually doing like a regenerative type thing for the downtown. Uh, but nobody was coming in and buying, like the people that had businesses were running their businesses, but nobody was coming in and buying buildings and like revitalizing. So we thought, you know what, we could do that. We could buy the town, turn the whole town around. And so <laughs> with, no experience on buying a downtown. We ended up buying about 50% of the buildings. So we bought a town. Wow. So, <laughs> so, wow. Some people uh, buy houses. Some people buy towns. What can you say? Uh, it's another towns. level, man. <laughs> yeah. I know. And you know, the funny thing is, first we thought, well, we'll just buy like one building. So we bought one building right on the corner, like a very important, prominent building. It mm -hmm. had been shut down for a decade. I said, well, you know, we'll, we'll start that building. We'll put an antique mall in there. The antique mall will help bring people downtown. Mm -hmm. Then someone else will buy another building and like it'll grow. And and a few months went by and nobody bought any more buildings. I'm like, okay, well, we'll buy another one. And then, you know, we bought another one. And then the, one of the ladies that sold us the building told all her friends, and she's like 80, husband passed away. She doesn't want these buildings told her friend and this one calls and says, Hey, I've got three buildings. And <laughs> next thing you know, we had 20 buildings. It's like, what are we doing? <laughs> so so wow. during the whole COVID thing, we actually opened four small businesses mm -hmm. in that downtown to bring people down and bring people shopping and to start during the pandemic, during the pandemic, during COVID, Amazing. I opened an antique mall, a clothing boutique, a marketplace and an event center during wow. COVID. Wow. And I know nothing about those businesses. I just applied my real estate skills. So it can't be that much different. Sure. And we opened <laughs> up these buildings. Ah, and I think like, what are we doing? So we are still actively investing. Uh -huh. uh, I, did, I took a break from the wholesaling and that because we're, we're, 
We're in a five-year plan with our little downtown. So you were able to prosper in the pandemic. Yeah, we did really well. Go ahead, bro. How did you... Okay, so I'm assuming then by buying your town, and I just like saying that, (laughs) I'll probably say it a bunch. Literally. That's my goal. You bought your town, and you started your your businesses, but you're still living in Florida, correct? Is that right? So right now I'm in Colorado. So we have a house in Colorado cost in Florida. But you're not living in the town. No, and, no, no. Uh, we go back and forth, but correct. Bill's family is from there. So one of the buildings has an apartment, so we have an apartment there. Okay. Okay. So I'm assuming, though, you had to employ some type of team to start the businesses and so yes. forth. Can you talk Can you talk to that? Because that's really interesting to me, how somebody can make it, make the purchase come up with the plan to put the businesses together. One business is a lot. Four is a whole nother level in your town. And then how do you put that team in place so quickly and effectively to actually make, I'm assuming there's the rehab and then there's the business that has to run itself. Yeah. Well, so before we bought the first business, like we really prayed about it because, um, the, the town it used to be like the place. It was bustly busy. Like everyone went downtown. And then they like out in the outskirts of town, they built a casino and a place for concerts and the Walmart and the Applebee's. And you know everybody went out, like out. Still in the same city of Clinton, Iowa though. And the few businesses downtown were just there forever. But there's so many buildings that were vacant. So like, okay, so if we're going to do this, you know, we're going to buy a building, we'll hire a manager. And so, so we sort of prayed about it and believe it or not, we ran an ad in Craigslist looking for someone to be a manager of an antique store. Wow. That's not in any self-help books right there. <laughs> right. Craigslist. And we met Mel, her name is Mel Gillespie and she is like, this is what she said. She says, well, I, I love antiques. I want to work in the antique mall. And she likes to repurpose furniture. She says, I'll make myself a little space in the back. I'll repurpose furniture. I'll sell it. And I'll run your store for you. So we're like, okay, that sounds really great. Well, Mel is a complete and total bulldog. And she's not that person that can put in like 20 hours and float through life, you know. And then she's like, listen, I need more. You don't need to buy some more businesses. I need some more stuff to do down here. So we're like, okay, so let's open up a clothing boutique. And so she is like the CEO of all the little businesses. She oversees them. She hires. She takes care of the employees. I have a, a property manager. I have a handyman maintenance guy, you know, that does the stuff. But my husband, his name is Bill Twyford. He really loves to build things. He's that guy that wants to build and, and see the work of his hands. So we just started going there and staying, uh, not during the actual beginning, but be, like the, right before the pandemic, the year and a half before the pandemic, we would just go and stay there for like three months. And he would, you know, work on this building and work on that building. And we kept renting out all these spaces. And then once we made the decision to open our own businesses, God brought Mel to us and I tell you, I don't even know what I would do without this woman. She manages everything, runs everything, hires everybody, and just keeps the ball rolling for us there. But we go there normally. We go there a lot, like every other month. Like We'll go there for a month in Colorado, a month in Florida, and go to Iowa for a month. So we sort of bounce around. Yeah. What are the biggest mistakes or biggest pitfalls uh, that you've seen from people that are trying to get into the investment side of real estate. Like these are the things that you should look for. These are the properties that you shouldn't invest in. These are the things that, Hey, if it looks this way, what are some of those things? Well, the biggest pitfall, cause you know, I, I do, I, um, you know, most people that are trainers sort of have like a specialty, whether it's flipping houses or rehabbing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I really am drawn to trying to help brand new investors, really with no experience, to come into the marketplace and have someone like me to mentor them so they don't make a bunch of mistakes. Because if there was a mistake to be made, I have already made it. And that's why I started putting programs and putting things together like, okay, so here's how you do it and here's how you don't do it. 
And I find one of the biggest things is that for people that want to even just start, the people around them, their lives, their family and friends, they have so many naysayers. You can't do that. Why did you make you think that's a bunch of get rich? Why would you think you could be successful? So a lot of people get stopped by the people that love them and want to help them. And then the ones that get past mm. that, people over-research. Well, I've got to learn every single wow. thing so I don't make a mistake. I'm like, no, just I'll help you. Just start. Sure. And then once people get started, I think sometimes they think it's going to be uh, easier than it really is. And if they struggle to find a deal, it's like, oh, I don't know if investing's for me. It took me three months to find one deal. But it's like the more you do the deals, the easier they get. Yeah. So people are their own worst enemy. Mm. Wow. They really are. People really, I mean, I hate to say it, but but we are our own worst enemy. And I've had so many people like, oh, Dawn, it's, it's been three months. But then they close the deal and they make like 50 grand. And next thing you know, they've closed 25 deals. I guess when I talk to them. So they don't, I don't think they give themselves um, the time. And I think they try to, if it's not happening just like so fast, I think they try to talk themselves out of it. Yeah, there's a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. And um, in that book, it says there's three failure diseases, procrastination, detailitis, and excuseitis. You kind See, of right outlined it. I just gave all you all the... three of those. I didn't yeah. even know that was in that book. And our families. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. A family is so well intentioned. They love you, but you can't listen to them when they're and they saying what you want to do. They don't say, share the same vision because they're not called to do the same thing. Yep. No. You know, I, can I give you like a real just short example, real quick? Is it okay? I had this woman, and uh, her name is Sheila, and she really wanted to be a real estate investor. And she's got four kids, and her husband works. He was like, no, I want you to stay home. I want you to raise the kids. And she's like, Dwan, I, I've seen you on your webinars. I just, I really feel like I, I want to do this. I'm called for this, but my husband won't support me. So he's telling her, no, you don't have any money. Da, 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 da. I'm not going to, you've got kids. Like just no help whatsoever. So I said, girl, listen, like how big are your cojones right here? She's like, tell me what to do and I'll do it. I said, okay. So you're going to hire a babysitter and they're going to come at whatever time your husband gets home. And they're going to give everybody dinner and get the kids bathed and put them all down. And at night, you're going to go meet with all these different people. And you're just going to hire a babysitter out of the, the money that you have. And you're going to go make it happen. So the babysitter shows up and her husband is livid because he will not watch his own. I'm not babysitting kids. And so, so she's like, hey, listen, this is what my mentor told me to do. I'm going out. I'm going to go. I made three appointments today from people that called from letters and stuff. So she goes and she's doing this till she closes her first deal. Every time the babysitter shows up, the husband refuses to help with the kids. He's all mad. They have a fight. She closes her first deal. I said, tell me the number one thing your husband wants more than anything. And he wants some crazy expensive set of golf clubs and some membership to some crazy country club. She took her whole check, which was like 20 grand, and bought him these golf clubs and bought him this membership and bought him all this stuff. And then, so he's playing golf and a couple weeks later, he's like, you know, if you want to do this again, I could probably watch the kids this time. <laughs> so now he starts watching the kids. And, I mean, this, woman, this woman is called. <laughs> Within a year, he's home with the kids because he didn't like his job and she's flourishing and they're millionaires. Wow. And I was like, if she would have listened to him and not really felt like she was supposed to do this, they would still be in the same situation. She's like, I just know I'm supposed to do this. I know it. And my husband won't back me. So when you have like a negative spouse or anything, it's really hard sometimes to start anything. Not just real estate, anything, even a podcast. If mm -hmm. you don't have a, a supportive spouse, a lot of people stop you from what you're called to do. Mm -hmm. You just have to ignore it and just blow past it. You do. And you have to share yeah. the vision. You have to share the vision with the spouse. Some, some guys are really bad at this. We, we, we really fail to share our vision with our, with our spouses. We just like, well, wait, I have to do this. This is what I need to do. It's going to be big. And uh, just trust me. No, we have to share our yeah. vision with them in a non rude, <laughs> nice sort of way well, to get exactly. by in. Will it happen every time? No, but at least you can get some heartstrings in there. So I'd like to, if, 
if Miss Lafayette has a bigger question, um, you were talking, oh, you were talking about family and business. Uh -huh. um, do you have, what kind of advice would you have? Because you were just talking about just now another example of somebody who wanted to start a business, but the husband was the kids, and you know, husband wasn't on board, and then magically he be, he got on board. But what advice do you have for parents who are juggling family and wanting to start? A business or maybe they're new into the business but i would really would think the starting is the hardest part it is um, it is Start, starting is and, the, and you know if, and people waste time like well i have to get my llc and i have to get this i have to get that it's like oh, just start already you know um i always tell people that tell me well i i've got two kids i can't do this i'm like take your kids with you my daughter has been with me knocking on 500,000 doors, it seems like. And I said, you know what? If you're going to uh, mail letters, for example, and these people call you back, take your kids with you. Put them in the car. Put on a movie. Give them some food. Take them to, you know, McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or something when you're done. Like, don't let that be the excuse. Figure out how to make them come with. And, and one of the things that I'm really good about is I help people that want to be full-time investors uh, make the transition from the job to the full time. And so just super quick, it's really easy. I just say, look, what, how much do you need a week to, what do you, what do you need every week to live on? And they say, I have to have a thousand dollars a week. I'm like, okay, so here's what you do. You close a couple deals and you put the money in the bank. You don't pay off credit cards. You don't pay off anything. You, you have $50,000 in the bank and you give your two hour notice and no, <laughs> give you two week notice. <laughs> And then you give yourself a paycheck every Friday. So you're living in the exact same means you're in today. Mm. And you have enough for a year. And during that year, you go to webinars, you go to seminars, you learn, you make it happen. You do deals. You don't let anything get in your way. If you do everything right, five, six months in, you'll never look back again. But people think, well, I need to pay off my car, pay off my house, pay off. I can't quit my job unless I pay all this stuff off. Say, like, no, 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 no. If you can budget, budget yourself out, just two, two or three deals, budget yourself out for a year and quit your job and do it full time. And a lot of people do, a lot, a lot of people only can put in two or three hours a week because they are the soccer mom and the yeah. coach and this and that. And they don't have a lot of time. Like you don't need a lot of time. If it takes you three or four months to close one deal, put the money in the bank. Three or four months to the second deal, put the money in the bank. When you get a year, quit your job, and now you get 40 hours a week. Yeah. And so many people, so many, I'm so proud to say, um, I have just hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people have been able to do this full time within the first six months. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Hundreds and of most, lives changed. Most, most, if you go to like a, a, a you know, a weekend seminar, you know, rah, rah thing, most of those people are like, oh, quit your job, do houses, just, you know, and it's like, no, you can't tell people to do that. People have bills and kids and responsibilities. And, and I don't believe, I, I am not from that belief that just buy my program and quit your job and make this happen because not everybody is truly a self-starter. So yeah. I'm like, hey, do some deals budget yourself and then dive in and at the end of the year if you get into the end of the year and you haven't closed anything and nothing has happened you can go back and get a job but you can't ever like you have to start but that's What's incredible that? because you came from that therefore you see that yeah. so before i had kids and i would try to i would be doing a business thing and people say well i don't know if i can because my children i had I had, I didn't make sense to me. I'm like, get a babysitter. Well, I can't get a babysitter five nights a week. And I'm thinking, well, is it worth it to you? I didn't say that, but I would think it. And now I have two and I completely understand. And you started a business with a young child. And so you understand, no, you don't, you, you can't just stop every, I mean, you can, but most people don't have that foresight or even the, the, sometimes it's just too hard. They're not going to make the steps if they have to quit their job. And so it's amazing that you went through the struggle yourself, came yeah. out the other end, and now you see what they're going through. Yeah. And so while so many people go through a struggle and don't realize that that struggle is literally your struggle, which is so cool, is literally 
has literally created a path for you to help other people with the yeah. same struggle. Ninety uh, percent of the people that invest in one of my programs or invest in me to coach them, their first thing is, "How do I quit my job?" And I'm like, "Well, we're not quitting your job today, so get that out of your head, because <laughs> you can't just throw someone into the water like that." And when my daughter was little, so you know, back then, kids didn't have to have their car seats in the back seat, like you know, yeah. they were right there with you. So she had her car seat and, you know, we had cassette players <laughs> in the car <laughs> and we had Disney sing-along tapes and they had these little things that are like steering wheels that kind of clip on the car seat. So she's got a little steering wheel and we played Disney sing-along tapes over and over and over. I was just like, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself if I hear one more Disney song. <laughs> but she kept her entertained. So yeah. she tried with me and we'd be singing and she'd have her little steering wheel and and I just made her part of it. You know, and when she was older and I was rehabbing houses, I like see this whole wall right here. You can paint, you can draw, you can color, you can dance to your music. Mommy's gonna work over here in the rest of the house. I just made her part of it instead of saying, Well, I don't have a sitter, so I can't do that. And I I just I didn't have money for a sitter, first of all. So and I didn't have a sitter. And I didn't, if I wanted to have a sitter, I would have just gotten a job and put her in daycare. So right. that was my whole why was I did not want to have my child in daycare. I wanted to be, and I'm proud to say I went on every field trip, every homeroom trip, every sleepover trip. I was a Girl Scout mom, a Daisy Girl mom, a Brownie mom. Like I did the whole thing, all of it. And I was yeah. just I'm really proud of myself that I, that I made that happen. It should be. Absolutely. Let me tell you, it was definitely, it was a God thing. Yeah. As, as a person that's trying to get into investing, are there certain types of properties that do better than others? You talked about the foreclosures or, you know, is it flipping? Is it short sales? What is that? Like that would be the most, yeah. I know you don't know this about me. Um, so back like 25 years ago, I was flipping and wholesaling houses. Mm -hmm. Deals were getting a little bit tighter. I started calling banks and saying, hey, can you take some money off this mortgage? And it short sales was not actually uh, specifically a coin term. It was shorting it, discounting it, shorting the mortgage. Um, I actually trademarked short sales as it applies to real estate investing and coined that term. So I have the registered trademark, an R, registered trademark on the term short sales for real estate investing. Oh, you're a beast. There you go. You heard it right here, now. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I am a beast. I was like, short sales. I like that. You know, I'm going to trademark that. So <laughs> I love it. Ah, so uh, for someone that's real new, I always tell new people, I said, listen, I don't care how much HGTV you watch. You cannot go and fix up those houses like that. That's not real life. Okay. Unless you have a crew. So get a house and just wholesale it. Flip it to somebody else. Let them do the work. And just do that until you get your feet wet and then see what you like. Some people love being landlords. Some people love, like I, I am so in love with commercial real estate right now. I can't stand it because we have all these buildings. I'm just like, ah, I'm losing my mind over it. And, uh, and I bought commercial in the past, but nothing, I think it's part of like the whole regeneration and rebeautification of this town. I'm like, so in that, you know, and Everybody will like different things, one more than the other, but they're very easy right out of the gate. If you have zero experience, just wholesale a couple houses and get your feet wet. Amazing. It's not going to cost you any money. And if you lose a couple deals, it's going to be time. And that time is education. So, Sure. Sure. Did you have a question, bro? No, I was just trying to understand how the wholesaling a house thing works. Because I've so heard of flipping houses. Like I find a homeowner foreclosure. They no. sign a sales contract to let me buy their house. So I buy it from Lafayette. I buy it. Mm. Then I go, well, okay. I don't know how to rehab. I don't know how to fix things up. I don't want to be Atlanta. So I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell it over here. I'm going to sell it to John. So I get it from uh, Lafayette. I buy it for 100 I sell it to you, John, for 125 And then you make it a rental. I just wholesale it. And makes I just sense. Yep. money in between. That so was my hunch. I just wasn't 100% sure. Yeah. It, and, and the thing <laughs> people are like, oh, I don't know. Is that legal? It's like, listen, every store in America that you shop at yeah. bought that food for less and sold to you for more. Right. Every right. item of clothing we have on, somebody paid less and sold to us for more. 
Sure. So wholesaling is how the world works. I just don't think people realize they can wholesale a house. Hmm. Because it's a big ticket item. But you mm -hmm. you know people that fix up cars and sell them? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So do it with houses. Dewan, if <laughs> leave our audience with, with the last word, a piece of advice, whatever you're feeling right now, uh, leave us with that last word. Okay, um, I, I feel like the main thing I want to impress on anyone, regardless of what kind of a business or entrepreneur or, or leadership, whatever you want to do, you really have to just tune out the other people and just let God guide your heart and it will work out. Yeah. You have to take the first step. The longer it takes the first step, the more chances you have of never doing it because it took too long to start. So start today. Absolutely. Start today, man. Connect with the one. <laughs> She's full of energy, great wisdom and insight, uh, awesome success story. And the ways that you can do that, uh, her Instagram and Facebook handle is at Dwanderful. And that is W D W A N D E R F U L. I love that name. That's very creative and very catchy. Thank also you. on LinkedIn, uh, Dwan Bent Twyford. Um, that is her whole name on LinkedIn and Dwan Bent Twyford at you on YouTube as well. Yeah. Uh, also you can buy Dwan's books, short sale, pre foreclosure investing, how to sell a house, when it's worth less than the mortgage and success onomics. Is there anything else, uh, any other place? Do you have a website that the uh, uh, Wonderful.com. <laughs> Wonderful.com. It's called Wonderful. I thought, you know, Dwan is such an unusual name. Yeah. People have such a hard time saying it. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do a play on my name. So I have sure. Wonderful, Dwantastic, my Dwandonaires or my millionaires. So I created like a whole vocabulary just around right. my craziness. That's that's excellent marketing. That's, that's excellent. <laughs> I love it. And then I, I made my it. hair pink. I was like, okay, yeah. I created a universe here. Yeah, that's, cool. that's your brand. That's amazing. That's it. Continue to follow us here on Unscript on our various social media platforms. Unscripted Authentic Leadership Podcast on Facebook. Our Twitter handle is at Unscripted Lead. Instagram at Unscripted Leadership. Our LinkedIn is Unscripted Authentic Leadership Podcast. Those of you that are not watchers, but you're listening, you're part of our listening family. You can find our podcast on any podcast platform. Stream it there on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, wherever you find your podcast. You can find us there. Type it in Unscripted Authentic Leadership podcast you'll find us there also those of you that are looking for a place for mentoring that are looking for a place of networking you're looking for a place to be poured into uh, resources to pour out into others you have something to offer uh, looking for peer-to-peer -peer group an intimate setting you can find that on our website unscripted-leadership.com where we are offering mastermind groups uh, unscripted-leadership.com also while you're there sign up for our unscripted email group where you'll receive emails about what we have going on with the podcast what's going on with the mastermind groups and when you do that we'll send you a 10 percent off promo merch code for our merch there again there on unscripted-leadership.com this has been an, another amazing episode here and again we th are thankful for our special guest uh, Dewan uh, Benford uh, Twitford that has come on and had this incredible conversation on how to build an empire while raising a family as always we're here to build bridges and not walls bridges connect and walls divide until next time we pray that you be the leader that God has called you to be God bless you <laughs>